Welcome back to the Student Hub Live Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Showcase of New Curriculum at the Open University. We've learned a lot of things that we didn't know today um, and we've just been talking with music and now we're going to be talking uh, about religious studies with Suzanne Newcomb who's joined us today with a range of things that um, I hadn't expected you to bring in today Suzanne. So thank you for coming along. But before we start on this session I just want to take a quick trip to Kath and Damon and see how everyone is doing at home. We're having some good chats on here with, to do with the music. We had a real debate regarding the word diva and whether it actually applies to Madonna. And there was a few contentious ideas on that one, um, given they were gauging it on vocal range rather than star yeah. quality. Yeah, it, it links back to, um, to the level one on the, the music degree where, where people study um, different forms of music um, through the jam, ending up with the seaside. But there's a thread of divas which run through it which runs nicely then into, into the second level music and, and then further on to doing your practical music and being a DV yourself at mm -hmm. Trinity Le Band. <laughs> yeah. So I think we have some budding divas in chat. Oh, excellent. <laughs> well, it never surprises me how innovative people are who come to the Student Hub Live and, and share their opinions and advice with everybody else. OK, Suzanne, we're going to talk about religious studies now. Again, this is something that people may not necessarily expect. But there are two particular modules that we wanted to focus on today. We've got A227, which is Exploring Religion, Places, uh, Practices, Texts and Experiences, and A332, Religion Today, Tradition, Modernity and Change. So two very exciting modules. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how studying religious studies at the Open University works? Well, what we're really excited about introducing today is a new pathway where you can do the religious studies um, year, year two and year three courses as part of your social science degree. So it's now for the first year open on the R23 pathway. So um, we've got two courses. The, the, the second year one is um, exploring religion. Um, and it focuses on places, practices, texts, and experience. And there's really a lot of social science in it. In fact, the whole discipline of religious studies was um, shares founders like um, Durkheim and Marx and Weber are the founding fathers of religious studies, essentially. So there's a huge overlap between all the rest of the social sciences and religious studies. And our third level course, Why is Religion Controversial, is um, really exploring the areas where religion and its practices and doctrines make a real impact on contemporary society. So we talk about veiling and jihad, but we also talk about things like yoga and um, controversial people like Jesus or um, ideas about the future, like the end of the world. So there's, there's, I think it's by far the most exciting subject on the curriculum, and I, I really hope to inspire some of you to, to take our, our modules. Oh, brilliant. No, it, it is actually, and, and the, one of the things is that we've been speaking today about how some of the academics sort of help foster some of the development of where particular modules go and some of the areas of concerns that are then showcased in modules. And the one thing that always strikes me with religious studies is how very interdisciplinary things are and how you've got, you know, academics from such a range of backgrounds within the department, um, you know, looking at various um, anthropological, sociological, all of the social sciences that you mentioned, those ways of looking at things make some of those issues really, really interesting and dynamic. No, absolutely. We've, we've got a theme in our department about looking at contemporary religion and historical perspective. And probably the dominant methodologies are those of the social sciences and of kind of a social history. We're not studying religions to find out the truth or... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Yeah, or whether there is a God or, or any of yeah, those questions. They're kind that of people... questions that you might go to a church to find out. We're looking at what do religious um, people who have people who are interacting with religion in some way, and they might even be atheists or people with no religion, but what what are they doing in society? How do they make an impact? How do their beliefs and practices um, reflect the social conditions and also change them? Mm. No, absolutely. Have a drink of water, Suzanne, because we've been sitting away. Everyone's been talking about biscuits back home, which I do appreciate as a thing of, of the, the time of day being nearly afternoon tea time. Um, Kath and Damon, do we have any questions that people would like to know about religious studies, um, or are they still just talking about music? Um, we do have someone who I think is, is saying it, it's a good thing to do something like this because it gives you a much better understanding of how religions impact cultures and what kind of differences it can make and why people may react the way they react so i think it's it's people are finding it interesting to find out it's not you're not just learning about the religion you're learning about the culture around it as well yeah i think people are, are interested to find out um 
the sort of cultural aspects rather than it being about religion as such, mm -hmm. but how it feeds into into everyday life um, and how that how people have come to to study religion. Um, and understand religion. I think that's that's really where people are heading towards. Mm. No, absolutely. Well, let's take the example of the yoga because I think that's one thing that could or could not be part of everyday life. But there's this International Festival of Yoga, isn't there? Yes, that's right. Next Thursday, in fact, is the International Yoga Day, which was established by the Prime Minister of India um, in 2015 by unanimous revolu <laughs> revolution, no, resolution in the United Nations. And this seems like one of the most uncontroversial things on first glance, everyone likes doing yoga for health and wellness. But in actual fact, um, the political positioning of yoga in contemporary India and how that um, relates to stories of nationalism and national heritage is something we look at in A332, Why is Religion Controversial and Controversial Futures? And, and how is envisioning the past of yoga and how it might um, serve India's future trajectory something that's of, of international significance, really. We asked everyone at home um, whether they think religion is relevant to understanding the contemporary <coughs> world. And uh, we had a sort of scale here of multi-choice questions. So let's see what you had to say. <coughs> so 60% are saying somewhat, 40% are saying a lot. Okay, um, so here we've got people sort of, again, we see some interest and in the, the widgets are changing all the time as well as we're filling those in, which is great. So we can see the variety then in terms of, of how important it is. So you say that this yoga day sort of seemed very uncontroversial, um, but why was it? Why was it controversial? Yeah. Well, part of the issue with the contemporary uh, presentation of yoga by the Indian government is that it's very much a Hindu Hindu nationalist thing. It's kind of associated with an ancient Indian tradition um, that is specifically Hindu in character. And some of the religious minorities feel that it may or may not be respecting their religious traditions right. is one. Another is the, um, the way it's seen as a health and well-being. And some people see it as a deeply spiritual part of their experience and something that doing for fitness kind of trivializes or, or makes light of. And then there's also the kind of commercialization and sexualization of a lot of modern yoga practices and, and how we see them. And this is also something that many Indians and some other dedicated practitioners find deeply offensive. So what we do in religious studies is we don't try to take necessarily a judgment on them, but to really pull out why are these issues controversial? Why does this group of people react in this way? Why do that group of people have these points of view? So we're, we're not trying to say what is the ultimate right or wrong, but how do you understand the situation? And this can be really important for anyone who interacts with religions in their, in their job, in a public service, in local government. There's all sorts of issues where you come across people who have really um, deeply held beliefs and practices that make an impact on our everyday lives. And so what we're doing in religious studies is, is learning how to analyze and, and think about those issues and, and react with respect, but also with, a, with an eye of kind of critical analysis of of what, what is going on here and how does this impact society. But it's also those various sorts of disciplines and ways of looking at things that irrespective of what you're studying, you know, you're building skills here about being able to look at different viewpoints. Um, <coughs> and I guess there are different ethical issues as well about who has a right to claim on what and for what purpose um, and, and how we can sort of all live in this global society with those various conflicts. No, absolutely. And so, um, in our curriculum in the religious studies department, we really go back to social science, empirical analysis, and, and this, the cross-disciplinary um, skills of how do you make a good argument, what's your evidence base. Um, but we also try to be respectful and agnostic about the experience of religious people. So to leave an open mind, uh, if someone says they're experiencing God, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. We can't say as social scientists, but we can explore what happens when they say that. We can note that they say that. And we can note that other people have different reactions. Mm. So it's really tools for life that you can apply to a whole variety of situations. Mm. And it's that social sciences aspect that's critical. It's not about theology as such. It's, no, it's about ways of looking at the world and ways of making sense of it. And, you know, to some extent, that's sort of, we've been talking about how things like economics can build very useful skills that you may not use in an economic context. But I can see the same argument for religious studies because it's those different methods of inquiry that you're building those skills on that you could apply to, to you know, problem solving in a variety of different contexts. No, absolutely. And the best thing about religious studies, in my opinion, is that it's just very interesting. I'm yes. always curious as to why do people believe that? Why do they do that? And 
so this this kind of subject area gives you a really a great chance to explore just kind of very basic curiosity about why why are people different? Why do they do such different things? Why are there such different ways of living and ways of thinking about right and wrong in some areas? Yeah. Now, a lot of students would take um, religious studies who were interested in various sort of um, disciplines that, that informed religious studies beforehand in an open degree. But now you've got this qualification pathway, which is very exciting. The R R23, as we like to call our qualifications with a, a, a letter and a number, and then we all try and remember them bitterly. Um, but, but, but this is a very exciting thing for us, isn't it? Well, it's really nice to have a degree that names some of the areas of your, your focus. And it's also uh, it's really great to have the freedom to explore. So you don't have to take this name degree to just take one of our um, modules. But having a degree with religious studies in it shows a specific area of subject knowledge that might be helpful if you want to be a, a school teacher or if you want to work in some kind of local government where you might be interacting with different constituents in the public. Um, but it also just shows that you've gone into depth into a particular subject area. And I, I really encourage everyone to, to find what subject area inspires them most. And I'd like you to try religious studies, but I think, <laughs> I think um, having that inspiration is really key to, to study at the OU. Mm. And tell us then about how you're studying. You, you mentioned that um, one of the key sort of themes within the department is looking at religion in a contemporary world. So can you tell us some of the sorts of things that are going on right now? I mean, I know that various people are off researching different things, which is why you are here solely representing the department today, because they're doing such exciting field work and, and various projects um, around the globe. So, so what's happening in the department? Well, um, one of my colleagues, Marion Bowman, has a very exciting project that she's coming to the end of involving cathedrals and pilgrimage routes. And this is something she's had long-term ethnographic interest in with Glastonbury for, for decades. Um, and they're coming up with some really exciting um, uh, models and um, understanding about how, what, how and why people are still doing pig pilgrimages, even if it doesn't seem as, um, as relevant as maybe it did in the Middle Ages. There's still a huge pilgrimage industry. And people visit cathedrals for tourism and, and heritage regions, and how is that changing our interaction with the sacred? Um, some of my other colleagues are, are, are looking at um, uh, indigenous religions. Graham Harvey's very interested in um, how indigenous peoples, the peoples who um, are, are, might be living in, in America or in Asia, in New Zealand and Australia, how they're both um, drawing on their historical traditions and also interacting with the modern world. And what does it mean when those who aren't ethnically associated become involved in these traditions? Mm. And what can we learn from traditions that have a much more, um, well, a very different view of how to interact with the non-human world? Um, and can that help environmentalist thinking? Can that help the way we're using the world um, if we think about it in a different way? Can that lead to a more sustainable future? Um, so my colleagues are also looking at histories of conflict in Europe and how religious conflict was um, resolved in the past and how this might lead to, to peacekeeping areas. My own research is looking at overlaps of yoga and Ayurvedic medicine um, in India and how these have become, how yoga has become more medicalized and in, in some ways more, more secularized and, and, and very much an everyday popular thing that we don't remark on now, whereas a hundred years ago it would have been some exotic um, thing that holy men in India might do that was slightly disreputable. Um, so there's all sorts of fascinating things. So you weren't very impressed with my account of what I use my yoga equipment for, which is an abs workout, which would probably be, you know, considered um, very remiss by the uh, people with the International Yoga Festival next week. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, there's also there's all sorts of ways of looking at yoga, and there's also the, the Indian government has done yoga as sport competitions. So it's really multifaceted. You can't re reduce it to any particular aspect. But well, it, it doesn't. I mean, the question then is: Would it be that some kind of blasphemy to not practice um, yoga with some sort of religious aspect in mind? Whether that was a spiritual alignment or um, calming thing, you know, where is the spirituality and that sort of thing? And, and I guess that's the whole point of the the conflict around some of this is, is where that matters and how it's expressed. Absolutely, and it's I, it's all contextual. So you have to look at what's going on, who, who are the people making what claims, and mm. what situation. Uh, yoga in schools is often a source of particular conflicts um, <clears throat> but there's, there's all yeah there's all sorts of things <laughs> to look at yeah well exactly and I can see why you have a three <laughs> module on why is religion controversial would be packed probably with lots of examples 
Absolutely. A lot of people really enjoy the veiling unit, um, as, as veiling is often in the news and, and the different laws in Europe, the different countries have different restrictions upon face coverings. Mm -hmm. But it's often really interesting to explore our own dress choices. So going back to the social science perspective, why I'm dressed in a, in a fairly smart way today, why I didn't come dressed in yoga clothes or, or wearing a sari. And people's veiling choices are quite similar. And so one of the things we really look at is, is how this has changed in different times and different places and how people interpret what the Quran says in different, in different times and places in different ways. And so there's a dialogue between um, the, te the religious texts as guidance and information and also particular social contexts and power dynamics and gender relationships and all sorts of those variables that social so scientists love to look at to try to focus our attention on the world and see things that we might not have noticed unless we're thinking in a more theoretical way. Mm. Let's take a quick trip to Kath and Damon and see how everyone at home is. Yeah, there's a, a lot of interesting chat, particularly along the sort of cultural encounters of, of religion. Um, so Damon's saying when he when he's out in the in the Far East, um, the the temples and the the beauty and the um, the regard that the, the temples are held in is is um, quite impactful. And he'd like to travel back in time and travel along the Silk Road um, and encounter the different religions uh, along the route. Um, there's some discussion about how Milton Keynes um, itself is is built along uh, religious lines, so allegedly along the ley lines. Um, and they're, they're just shifting on to whether Jediism can be classed as a, <laughs> as a religion. It's Paul in the chat. <laughs> yeah, there's a short, in Open Learn, there's a very short little piece where we discuss that. But it's not a flippant question because as people are um, identifying as no religion, we're, um, we're changing our understanding of how we find meaning and, and purpose in life and how we orient ourselves. So often no religion doesn't actually mean that there's no... Um, no spiritual beliefs or no way of orienting towards the more than human world or ha how we find meaning in life. It just means we don't want to identify with an institutional religion. Yeah. People are very skeptical, increasingly skeptical about identifying with institutions, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that beliefs and practices that might be called religion are, are going away. And we've actually got two scholars in the department who are exploring non-religion, one's in Orkney and one's in Cyprus, and they're making a comparative study on this with the Templeton grants to kind of explore how, how are people still using um, uh, kind of ideas that may or may not be religious in a different time and place, even yeah. though they identify as no religion. Because no religion is growing, isn't it, proportionately in the UK. It's, so. it's the, the biggest growing um, section of the population, although quite a lot of people will nominally um, identify as Christian, they don't actually go to church. Yeah. And so, so what does this mean? And, and we also look at ideas about atheism and, and Richard Dawkins, and th these are kind of a ne cognitive neuroscience, and what can that tell us about religion? Yeah. So there's all sorts of ways of looking at religion, um, which are, are, are quite fascinating, and it's all about how we as humans understand the world around us. Brilliant. No, well, that's fantastic, Suzanne. Thank you so much for coming and giving us a flavour of what's going on in the department and, and also, you know, how you're unpicking some of these issues and looking at things in a very interesting and, and multidisciplinary way. Right, we're going to have a, a quick break now with another video um, and we're going to do another Who's Who video um, and then show you um, a classics video about Troy um, because our next session is going to focus on classical studies, um, which I know that a lot of you have been looking forward to. Um, so join me um, for exploring the classical world with Phil Perkins in just a few moments after this break.